Hello and welcome to the PPW pod, bringing you news, views and interviews from the world of online marketplaces and prop tech. My name is Edmund Keith. I'm the editor of OnlineMarketplaces.com. Joined this week by uh, Simon Baker, I think from Madrid as well this week. Um, you right, today Simon? I'm in Madrid, but tomorrow I'll be somewhere else. And uh, delighted to say we're joined from, I believe, Mexico City by Bernardo Cordero, who is uh, the co-founder of Cloud.com, formerly known as uh, Flat.mx. How are you doing, Bernardo? Well, well, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, great to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, here connecting from, from Mexico City um, and, and ready to go. Cool. So um, the reason that we wanted to get you on, well, there's several reasons. Um, we will get to cloud.com a bit later on. But kind of one of the big reasons we wanted to get you on is because we've been talking about the Mexican market recently. And I've actually been researching an article that will be coming out on online marketplaces very soon. It turns out the Mexican market is actually really interesting. Um, personally, I had kind of assumed that the Mexican market was completely sewn up once uh, Quinto Andar bought out the two kind of leading players. But um, there's all sorts going on in the Mexican market. Some really interesting stuff. Cloud is obviously part of that. Um, before we get into the Mexican market, before we talk about Cloud, I want to get a bit of background about the company, about what was flat.mx or dot flat.mx, I should say. Um, so what I tend to like to do with guests is not just tell, you know, have them tell me all about their companies. I like to see if my research is uh, on point. So I'm going to basically give you a bunch of bullet points that I have found and you can, you know, tell me if they're true or false, basically. So sure. as I understand it, you founded Flat uh, as a pure kind of iBuyer back in 2019 with your co-founder, uh, Victor Noguera. It then, you got funding for some, you know, really prominent people in the world. Um, so things, people like Open Doors, Eric Wu, um, Fly Homes' is, um, CEO, Tushal Garg. Um, then you got a, a 25 million Series A in 2021. Um, and then another kind of undisclosed round in 2022. Am I, am I correct? Am I going along the, the right line yeah, so far? You're, 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 you're on the right path. Um, some small details. And, and yeah, we start off very focused on, on the eye buying part of the business. Uh, it was a part of several other things we were building, but that was the focus at the, at the time. Uh, went through a few rounds. You mentioned some of the names. Those are, those are accurate. The Series A was uh, around actually 19 million, so a bit below what, what you're seeing there publicly. Um, and and okay. then we've, we've done another round after that, uh, more of an internal round. Uh, but yeah, uh, on, on the right path. Okay. Um, and then am I right in thinking, so you were an iBuyer started in 2019, like a lot of iBuyers. So I'm thinking of, you know, people like Loft, people like Casavo, you kind of started to pivot slightly away from iBuying around 21, 22. So instead of pushing users towards the pure iBuying, you start of kind of, um, kind of nudging them towards like buyer representation product that you had. Um, and then in 2023, correct me if I'm wrong again, you bought out a company called uh, Intelimetrica, which is like a property data um, platform, bought out a mortgage brokerage service called uh, Hipoteca Genial. Uh, and then as we'll get to later in 2024, you announced this rebrand to Cloud and uh, to like a pure portal model. Is that yeah. so far so correct or are there nuances to that? There's some nuances. So as, as we mentioned, we start off in, in 2019, very focused on the iBank part of the business. Uh, I would say we always, from day one, if you would have seen our pitch deck, we are very focused on how do we create a complete solution, a complete ecosystem for residential real estate in the market in, in, in Mexico. Um, and we started with that core of iBuying and started building a marketplace around that. We started looking at doing things around financing data and everything else um, from that point on. 2022, as you mentioned, similar to other 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 eye buyers, uh, we made decision um, not to not to just uh, simply uh, fade away from it, but we went pretty aggressively. At, we completely stopped doing eye buying, um, and for us, it was the 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 business was actually working fairly well. No, we had 20% spreads on the properties we were buying and we were selling. Uh, and I would say there's a couple things that happened. No, the first thing is. This is the simple scalability of, of two things. No, one is capital. No, so markets started getting more complex. Um, so once we had 
300 properties on, 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 on our site. And we thought about how do we get to 10,000? How do we get to 20,000? Just the amount of capital that we thought we were going to need, uh, especially on the debt side of the business. And with debt becoming much, much more expensive, we, we, we saw a huge issue there in terms of scalability on the, on, on the financing part. And the second one we saw was simply the scalability of the operations of it. You know, we had these 300 properties um, and there wasn't a week that, that went by where we didn't find um, some operational complexity, right? Whether it was um, the building's management that maybe didn't pay for the water that month, so we couldn't sell the property. Um, having issues with neighbors within, within the buildings. Um, some legislation that complicated the selling of a property. Um, so when we saw that business, we said, hey, we need to get to those 10,000, 20,000 homes quickly. What we saw is that the technology that we were able to build simply wouldn't solve a lot of those manual processes that we had to do with the, the homes. So we did a pretty quick uh, switch at that point. Uh, and we said, hey, we've already built out this marketplace. Uh, we already have some of these other assets. Let's completely stop acquiring homes. And we had an internal team at that time um, that was helping us sell, helping us sell those properties. Um, and that's where we would focus more on what any broker, right? Where we had our internal brokerage, we we're using technology to become much more much more efficient. And then as we got closer to 2023, uh, what we saw was that. Even with that model, we saw some issues in terms of scalability, right? Just the amount of hires that we had to do as we opened up new markets, um, the complexities of making sure that our own team was as efficient as using third parties uh, was, was an issue. Um, not getting paid commissions. You know, a big issue was well, there were commissions that we wouldn't get paid uh, for some reason or another. Uh, and that's when we made a very decisive decision uh, to focus that marketplace more on a portal view. Right. And uh, I'll get back to that in a second. But the core of the business today is that portal where we're connecting buyers and sellers with uh, with the best agents in the area they're looking to transact. In. And then on top of that, you add a couple of transactions that we made. Right. We bought a data company called Intelimetrica a couple of years back. Uh, for us, it was a very, very key acquisition because we feel that one of the biggest issues in Mexico is um, simply there's no, there's no data out there to understand what 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 homes are valued at or should be valued at. And that's a huge part of the complexity. We can come back to that. And the second acquisition that we made last year was buying the mortgage brokerage, Hipoteca Genia. And for us, those are kind of the three key pieces that puts everything together, right? How do we create a complete um, ecosystem where we're able to help with the data, where we're able to connect the buyers and sellers with, with agents? And then also, how do we help with the financing of the property that, that, that they want to purchase? Uh, and once we put all that together uh, and we are thinking about kind of the future vision, we saw in the market, talking to people on the street, there was still some confusion in terms of what we did, right? We had made a couple of pivots in the market, et cetera. And you talk to an agent, you'd ask about flat. And they said, oh, yeah, they're the ones that would buy and sell homes, even if it had been a year, two years since we stopped doing it. Um, and the more and more we talked about it, we felt that the best way to go move forward was, hey, we've created this this this, this ecosystem. We need to make sure that people understand what we're actually doing. Uh, and that's when we decided to come really aggressively doing a complete rebranding of what we're doing. Uh, and we barely launched Cloud, cloud.com a couple months ago um, and working hard on, on, on growing the business. I got, a, I got a couple of questions around this. Um, help me understand this 20% spread that you were getting on the iBuyer model. Because that sounds, yep. you know, it, it sort of implies that you're buying for 100 and selling for 120. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, um, so so close to that. So we were basically uh, a home that was valued in the market at 100. We were buying it at 85, um, and we were doing some remodeling and selling it at 105, right? And that would give us kind of that growth spread of 20% uh, approximately that I was that I was talking about before. Um, and this is there, there's there's a couple there are several things that go into that. No, first is it was a 15% discount to the actual value of the property. Um, but what the customer would feel is that it was a much bigger discount because the actual transaction price that they would get probably after a year would have been that hundred. But in their minds, their home was probably worth 110 or 115, right? So for them, it seemed like a pretty good discount. Um, it was. I would say a um, a very good product for maybe three to five percent of the sellers in the market. We would talk to hundred sellers, three to five percent of them would would agree with it, and it would be an amazing product for them. But we were leaving out the other ninety five percent of sellers in the market that didn't need to sell in a matter of days or in a matter of weeks. Uh, and for us, that was a big frustration in terms of we're not really solving the problem for hundred percent of sellers in the market. Yep, and I think that's sort of you know. 
the same sort of issue that Zillow faced at the end of the day was to really solve the problem for you know, the vast majority of people in the market, you had to get close to market price. The closer you get to market price, your spread is going to get naturally very squashed. And then I'm, I'm curious if your gross spread was about 20%, what, what was the net at the end of the day with carrying costs, repairs, maintenance, all the issues, and, and clearly time, the time that it takes to, from buying to selling? Yeah, we're probably getting close to around net around four percent once you uh, contemplated uh, cost of cost of debt and some other costs that we had, um, as, as as you mentioned, um, and we we're turning the homes over uh, around uh, every four months, something like that. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't so the, the 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 numbers weren't so bad and they're actually pretty decent. Um, and, and actually, if somebody asks me about I buying, um, I still think it's a good business, right? There's still opportunity because different from Zillow in the U.S. In the U.S., it takes you maybe 90 days to sell a home, right? In Mexico and Latin America, or at least in Mexico, it takes you a year, a year and yeah, a half. Because it's a interesting. Home. But I have, I have a, sort of a question. You know, my observation would be you, you're doing better than Zillow that was losing on each transaction. And then second is what's interesting is um, you're making about a four percent return um which has got to be pretty much the same as a real estate agent makes from their commission in the sale of a property but without all the hassle of the carrying costs and and so on um have you you know in your new model um with cloud are you into the transaction as in helping facilitate the transaction as well and capturing a percentage of the commission or is the underlying model more a traditional um advertising model We've gone much more traditional um, to the advertising model where we're charging up front on lead generation to the agents, both on the buyer and the seller side. Um, and we went that route uh, because I, I, I mentioned it quickly, but we did e-brokerage for a while where we were participating in the transaction. Uh, but we, what we still saw in, in Mexico was that um, there was a lot of transactions that we weren't getting paid commissions for, right? And it's really, really hard um, to track actual transactions in the market today. So the ability for us to make sure that we're earning our, our commission on every single one of the transactions that we participate in, it's still very, very complex in, in, in Mexico. Um, so for us today, the way we've designed the business is very focused on uh, charging up front, charging for lead generation. Uh, we're still involved through the process beyond just giving the, 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 the lead. So in the future, as we continue to grow, as we continue to build data, et cetera, there will probably be opportunities we can start participating in the commission again, uh, but always working with third-party agents and uh, very focused on making sure that we're, that we're adding value from the beginning to, towards the end of the transaction. How do you, you know, you, you're, you're, you're working with agents, you're working with buyers and sellers and so on um, in this process, and you're not only providing an advertising vehicle, but also... You talked about data and you talked about mortgage brokerage services. Um, what is your major driver of revenue at the moment? Yeah, um, so th the major driver today uh, is still on the, um, was actually more on the mortgage brokerage side of the business. Uh, I would say between the mortgage and the data part of the business is probably uh, the two biggest drivers today. Today, the platform, uh, we basically launched it two months ago. Uh, it's the driver of volume. It's the driver of the ecosystem. It's the driver of uh, what brings in buyers, sellers, agents. But in terms of revenue, uh, today's actually the smaller of the three. Uh, but that's changing dramatically, right? I mean, it's 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 been a couple months. We've signed up over five thousand agents. Um, so I think if you're asking me that question today. If you ask me that question, probably in three four months, there's going to be a huge movement of that. If we see the business a year two years down the line. Without a doubt, the portal will be the biggest driver of the business, um, and that portal will be the biggest driver of how we generate traffic to to, to the other part, specifically on the on the mortgage side of the business. Uh, I would say the data part of the business, which today uh, it's a very interesting now, part now of I, the revenue. Yeah, I was just going to say the data part of the business. It's sorry, a very interesting say, part of the um, revenue today. You, you got uh, it. But but at the end of the day, it's not a business that we see growing 100x, 200x in terms of revenue but it's, it gives us a huge differential, right? Because we're able to have better data than anyone in the market. And that actually brings in more and more people to the site. Okay. Are you, now, a, a couple of questions. You acquired the data business, I think you said earlier, and you are, did you acquire the mortgage broking business or did you build that? 
we acquired that one as well. Okay, so and that was I assume. So I'm just trying to understand that that since the the way to think about this is you started in sort of 2019, 2020. You've raised somewhere north of probably 20 odd million in this whole process, or close to it at least. Um, you've the i buying model sort of came and went, and you've ended up back at back at a, at, a, at a at a two businesses that you purchased, which I assume which was from the funds of the twenty odd million would have gone to that, um, and and then um, you've gone back to the the uh, portal model, which I think makes a lot of sense in that market. Um, how if you before we talk about the future and where it's going, how when you look backwards? Would you think what are the sort of key lessons learned? Because one of the things I like people to to walk away from these podcasts is, well, what 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 have people learned in building a business over the last say five four five years since twenty nineteen, so about five years um, in the process? What would you do again, and what would you do differently? Yeah, um, so I think there's there's several things. It's all it's also I think easy to see in retrospect several several things that we could have done differently. At the same time, I think um, the biggest thing we would probably do differently is just to use at the end of the day less capital um, to make some of the learnings that we that, that that we made along the way. Right? I think starting with the iBuyer model for the moment in the market uh, made a lot of sense, but the market changed, right? And I think we made the right decision of pivoting out of it um, as quickly as, as as we did as we did. Um, and it actually doesn't mean that five years, 10 years down the line, we might not do something to give liquidity to sellers uh, that actually might help that three to five percent of sellers on the platform in some way. So I think those learnings uh, might actually come back and help some of the ecosystem that that, that we're building. Uh, and the same thing when we had our, our, our own agents, right? I think there's a lot of learnings there. There are some interesting things that at that point made sense. Um, but as, as you go along, as any any new project I think you have the, have the ability of trying things in the market, seeing what works, and then making hard pivots as long as, you, as, as, as long as you're adamant about making them as quickly as possible and learning as quickly as possible. Could we have learned some of those uh, lessons with a little less capital? And you mentioned how much we had raised at the beginning, for sure. Uh, but I think that's the biggest thing. I was going to say one of the related questions is, and I've been in a lot of businesses where you've had to pivot, is how do you deal with shareholders? Who've invested, you know, twenty odd million in, in 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 rounds, and and had an expectation they were investing into an high buy business, and here they are, a few years later, they've invested into a mortgage broking data business and a port, property portal. How do you handle their managing their expectations and their um, uh, support of the business? Yeah, um, so I would say it's a couple of things. No, and one is the stake of the investors. No, which you're talk- you're asking about, and the second one is also the team. Yeah. In, in, in the employees, um, and I would say the actually if you have the the right investors, uh, especially early stage investors, uh, I don't think any sophisticated early stage investor um, thinks that what they're seeing up front at the beginning when they're investing um, in those earlier rounds is what the company is going to actually end up looking like exactly in the future, right? I think um, those early investments that we got on, I think they were investing in how do we solve um, the problem in real estate in Mexico. Um, how do we build a business that can grow over time and really solve the customer's issue? And I think they're investing in, in, in us as founders, Victor, Victor, and myself. Um, so I think as we've gone along the way, as we've explained the pivots that we've done in the market, investors are very on board in terms of the opportunity to change things in Mexico uh, is still huge, right? The size of the market is still huge. If you look at the other players in the market, there's still a wide open space to solve a lot of things that we're solving. Um, so uh, for sure, there's always conversations around, hey, is the way you're, you're, you're going about the next pivot or the way you're, you're, you're thinking about the next evolution, is that the right, right way to go or not? And we have a lot of those conversations. Uh, but at the end of the day, as an investor and as a team that is executing in the market, I think we've always been on the same page in terms of there's still a huge opportunity and we need to continue evolving until we uh, make sure that we find that exact product market fit that we're always, that we're always looking for. Uh, and then that second part is the team, right? And I would say that's even more complex than the investors, right? Because the team, they sign up for a certain business. They sign up for uh, doing a certain job within that company. And there's a lot of work with the team in terms of, hey, we've been talking about this vision over the last six months or last year, and now we're going to make a hard pivot towards towards the other way or towards another vision. 
how do you continue to have them on board? Um, that's a much bigger challenge, I would say, than even the investors. Okay, I want to move on. Um, so you mentioned there the opportunity in Mexico, and this is something having done research for this article that I've come across quite a lot. A lot of VC dollars were poured into the market. A lot of companies from other parts of Latin America moved into the Mexican market from kind of 2019 to about 2021. It seems to me, at least from the outside, that they've maybe slowed down the investment a little bit. Um, and you read a lot about, um, you know, growing middle class, demographic tailwinds. Um, whenever you read anything from Mercado Libre, they always say Mexico is a very underbanked market and there's a big opportunity there. But then there's also um, kind of disparity with um, house prices, outstripping wages, kind of anecdotal reports of Mexico still being kind of volatile and violent and all the rest of it. What is your experience of the market and how big do you think the opportunity still is in the Mexican market for prop tech companies such as yeah. yourselves? Yeah, so I think there's a, a, a fairly clear indicator of the opportunity to continue growing in the market, right? So, for example, if you look at um, number of visits uh, to portals per month, there's about 6 million visits to portals in, in, in Mexico out of a population of around 120, 130 million. So that's about 5% of population uh, does a search uh, per, per, per month. If you look at other countries, right, you look at the U.S., it's about 300 million visits a month to different portals, population around 300 million. It's close to 100 uh, percent. We see more advanced as well in, for example, Spain, I think it's about 120 percent. So huge opportunity to bring a lot of those uh, buyers and sellers online, um, whether it's through a portal, through other um, tech, tech solutions. Um, and why do we think that? This will change dramatically in Mexico in, in the near future because we see it across the board in other verticals, right? So, for example, I was in e-commerce uh, starting in around 2012. At that point, retail uh, Mexico was probably about 5.5 percent of retail in Mexico was done was done online, right? So, barely anything. Today, it's about 15 percent, right? And it's growing about 30 percent every single year. So, Mexico is actually the fastest growing country in the world in e-commerce. Um, so dramatic change, right? So from 0.5 to 15% over the last 12, 12 years in the country. We see similar things in fintech, right? Where you talked about um, underpenetration, about financial solutions, et cetera. The amount of growth that we've seen in financial solutions in Mexico has been, has, has been very impressive. So in Mexico, we've gone from very high usage of social media, uh, very high usage of any type of online media, e-commerce booming, uh, fintech uh, growing very rapidly over the last few years. And we're going to start seeing a lot of that coming into um, the real estate space, right? And customers simply get more accustomed to using more complex and complex uh, um, um, offerings online. Um, so I think we're going to be seeing that. We're going to be seeing that much faster than a lot of people would expect over the next few years. Okay, another kind of follow-up question. I've heard from other people who run real estate portals in Mexico that it's um, a very regional market. So you have maybe one real estate portal that's very strong in one region and then not very strong in another region. I imagine that's kind of part of the opportunity, right? Um, if you know that you don't have such a domination from one brand, there are opportunities in, in certain regions. Is, is that accurate? Yeah. So, so it's definitely accurate. And also part of your, your, your previous question, you mentioned it quickly. No, we, we, we did see in general and talking about kind of the competitive environment, uh, we saw in Mexico, just a huge influx of, uh, startups focus on, on, on real estate and prop tech, um, starting around 2020, 2021, right. And we got companies coming from pretty much Latin America, but from pretty much other, every other big country in Latin America, there was, there was founders of companies coming into, coming into Mexico. So it got pretty crowded. Um, what we've seen over the last 18 months to two years was fundraising got more complicated. We talked about some of the changes that we've made, and that's definitely been a challenge for, for, for us as well. Uh, but for us, one of the things that that's brought is uh, a lot of these competitors have had to go back, right? Their original markets were outside of Mexico. They've had to go back focus our capital on the regional market, the same way that we're focusing our capital into, into Mexico. And that's just presenting a very, very big opportunity for us uh, because there's very few competitors uh, doing what we're, what we're doing in, in, in the market. Um, so that kind of is a larger, uh, more competitive landscape um, that, that we see. Now more on, in terms of what you're talking about now, kind of the, the different regions, et cetera, uh, we definitely see uh, a lot of difference, a lot of differences there, right? You see the big cities, right? You see Mexico City, Guadalajara, Monterrey, uh, where you see 
um, some of the portals there. And you have kind of the north of, of, of the country where you're starting to see a ton of movement with everything that's happening and nearshoring. Um, and then you see the beaches, right? You see the coasts where you start to have a lot of mix between um, local demand and international demand. Um, so these are a lot of different things that go into uh, the different landscape and, and, and the different offerings out there. And I think, as you said, that brings a very, very good opportunity uh, because I think there's not one place uh, where uh, it's, it's, it's set in stone that there's a clear winner going forward over the next five, 10 years in the market. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I think there's still a, very, a pretty big blue ocean for us to continue to go after. Okay, that's interesting because, I mean, I, I take your point, but I kind of counter it with you've got Quinto Andar, which is a you know a huge prop tech company, really well funded. They've got the number one and well, kind of possibly the number two player. Um, then you've got Tuabi, which is kind of, you know, quite a well funded company that have their own real estate portal. You've got Lifeful, uh, which is obviously a very big publicly traded company who operate Lamudi. There's a lot of competition. Um, now, I, you know, I take your point that uh, there's a lot of um, growth left in the market, but there is also, to my eyes at least, quite a lot of competition. What, you know, coming in with cloud.com, which is a new brand, how, you know, how, how do you think about competing with these guys? What are you gonna do to, to stand out? Yeah. Um, so I would say first, um, the, the biggest thing when, when the, the, there's two stakeholders that are um, what we have to be looking at, right? And one is the agents, right? And what are they seeing? What are they looking at? Um, and, and what are they saying? Um, and we talk to agents on the ground um, and there's not an agent out there that isn't looking for alternatives in the market, right? They're, they're, they're looking for other opportunities, other players to work with. Um, they don't believe that there's a solution today um, that has their best interest at, at, at hand. We think there is just a huge yeah, opportunity. I've read that right? Kindrandar is very unpopular among agents at the moment. <laughs> there's a bit uh, of a revolution going I've, I've read. Yeah, there's, 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 there's definitely some discontent there. Um, and then the other stakeholder that you have to look at is buyers and sellers, right? And, and, and buyers or sellers are definitely going to, to those sites that you're talking about right now. But again, if you talk to buyers and sellers and you ask them about their experience um, online, there's still a huge opportunity to build out a much better product, a more complete product. Um, that, that, that's one of the biggest things that we're working on right now. If you look at the customer journey uh, of a buyer, the first thing that you have to do is uh, figure out how much, or, or, or buyer or seller, right? How much am I selling home at? How much should I buy my, 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 my home at? We're the only player in Mexico that has actual transactional data on more than 60, 70% of the transactions that are happening in the market. Nobody else has this information. Um, so how do you help out with that, with that data in the market on that first step? Then how do you connect them to the best agents that are working in, in, in the regions? We talked about some of the issues that the agents are already facing on, on other portals, right? And you have to help them out with the financing, right? How do you put the financing together with that ecosystem? Uh, and again, we're the only player that's really integrating that in a form that that, that, that we believe uh, is actually helping customers throughout that that, that complete journey. Um, and as we put these pieces together, I would say, if you look beyond just a classified listing site, how you create a complete ecosystem that is actually solving um, the customer's uh, issues with the transaction, there's still a huge wide open space there. I got a... a, a, a different perspective. I've known the Mexican market since I did some work there with Metros Cubicos back in 2010, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, 15, probably about 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. Long time. Um, and, and you know, the a, cu a couple of thoughts about what you said. I mean, I'm yet to see an agent anywhere in the world with any property portal in the world who says they're truly happy. Right? Sure. They just it's just something that's very common amongst agents around the world is that they're never happy, right? Even if you give it away free, they're not happy. Okay. Yep. So that, so yeah, you'll, you'll absolutely be able to talk to the customers out there and, and, and such, um, and, and get that sort of feedback. Um, the question is then, will they, will that noise turn into action? You know, will it, will they actually a spend money on you and then B stop spending money on someone else? to thus give you that differentiation. And that, that is something that is, you know, time will tell. I mean, I, um, everyone has the aspiration that they will, but history, history, the good thing about having been doing this for 25 years is 
I, I, I look back a lot and I see a lot of the stories and a lot of the business cases that were put forward and what worked and what didn't work. And a Me Too, even a Me Too with a slightly different variance on it, it's hard to dislodge someone like in Waveless Venta Quattro, who's, who's clearly got a, a strong, a strong, much stronger brand in the market and has been there for long enough that they've, they've, um, uh, build a build a degree of a reputation. That's the that's the big hurdle to overcome, both with agents and more importantly with the with the buyer side. I mean, the agents will represent the sellers at the end of the day, so that's not going to move it a lot. Um, and I think then that's the real challenge: is how do you do something different from the buy side, so that you can generate the leads, so that you get you attract the audience. Are you going down the path of the Zillows and Zooplas of the world and making your um, AVM model free so that they can then claim their homes, check the value, follow the value over time and do that as a differentiator? Or are you going to charge for that service? Yeah, we we are making um, the, the, the service free. Um, as I said, when, when you think about kind of that year, year and a half that it, that, that it takes for a transaction to happen in the country, uh, probably six to eight months of that is um, actual uh, trying to find uh, pricing discovery, right, of, of, of the seller and the buyer. Um, so for us, allowing that information to be free on the site, allowing the seller to come on, figure out how much do they sell, sell their home for, and the buyer will have information to make a quick decision on, is this priced correctly or not, uh, it can take out probably six to seven months of that uh, pricing discovery that actually happens in the market. Um, so we are making that that, that information free. Um, today it's free on our site. Any seller, any buyer can go on our site and figure out how much their home is worth um, w- without it costing them a dime. Um, and that's a big part of how you bring those customers on the site, having them have much more information that they have anywhere else. And as you said, that brings in the leads and that starts a lot of this ecosystem that, that we're building. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of people are, are going down this path of trying to build a, an, an ecosystem and where they tend to um, not work so well is they are reliant on the consumer to use the tools, whereas the mortgage the data, um, contract management, whatever. And where many of them sort of pivot to is providing an agent ecosystem. So the agents have a, uh, an environment where they can um, you know, do the transaction end-to-end at a much lower cost um, or much higher speed um, than what their current brokerage provides. So how do you, how do you think about this ecosystem, um, given that given the role of agents is not disappearing, hasn't disappeared anywhere in the world, um, mm-hmm. in reality. So how how do you see the role of the agent versus as 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 your prime customer, or is it the buyer and the seller are the prime customers? And if it right. is the agent, what are the tools or the environment you're really creating for them? Yeah. Um, so so at the end of the day, I think you you have. To, you kind of have to choose one or one or the other, but at the end of the day, you can have the best tools for agents. But if you don't have buyers and sellers on the platform, you're not generating generating value from them from the start, right? So, for without a doubt, we do see ourselves as we have to generate the volume of leads that that will actually make this interesting for any agents on our site. But now, when you go into the tools, right, and how you build them and who you build them for. Uh, we're definitely more focused on the agent side um, than we are at, on, on, on the end consumer, on the buyer and the seller, right? So, for example, for agents, we talked about the data. That's available for the buyer and seller. Uh, but we've also built a lot of it for the agent to where the agent can go with the, with, with the seller. And they can tell the seller, hey, um, you've uploaded your home at this price. Uh, but the information that I'm getting from Cloud is telling me that um, you're more expensive because of X, Y, and Z, right? So you should change your price for, 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 for this. We're really allowing the agent to have that information firsthand so they can work with that with that seller uh, with that information. Uh, for the agents, uh, more than just generating leads, we're also able to connect them to other agents to, so, so that they can work together on connecting potential buyers that some other agent might have to come to the inventory of, 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 of another agent. Uh, when we talked about financing, uh, for sure, we get financing directly to um, directly to buyers. Uh, but the main way that we're creating financing is allowing that to be a tool for the agents that have 
the buyer and that they're working with the buyer, that they can they can work or, or connect them also on the on, on the mortgage side of the business. Um, so if you think about how we're building it, it goes much more towards all the all that technology, all that all all, all that tech, allowing the agents to be much much more efficient okay, so that, um, than the that, other way around. That that all makes sense, but um, the the question is, you start off by saying. You know, the first thing is I've got to get the buyer. I, mean, I can have all these wonderful tools, but I've got to get the buyers. So how do you think around brand building, aggregate, you know, getting buyers? What are your major um, go-to-market strategies from that perspective? Yeah. And I'm assuming um, you've got a lot of listings through a, some sort of freemium model. Yeah. So we... At the end of the day, like any marketplace, you have to have both sides, right? Uh, you can't say I just have the buyers and the sellers, but I don't have the agents. And you can't say I just have the agents, but I don't have the the, the buyers or the sellers. Um, so I think we can we can discuss all day, but I think at the end of the day, you need to have both sides of that marketplace for the, for this for this to work. Um, in terms of the properties, um, it's something that's been growing dramatically, right? I mean, we started uh, when we started pivoting models, we might have had. 5,000 homes a year ago. Today, we have over 9,000 listings on uh, on the site. Uh, we should be tracking to 150, hopefully 200,000 over, over the next year. Um, and that inventory is coming in because we're not only, as I said, we're not only generating um, the buyer and direct seller leads, but we also create a, a, a CRM type where what we call the Bolsa Inmobiliaria in Mexico, where we allow the agents to connect with each other, right? And they're allowed to uh, upload their inventory for free on, 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 on that platform. And that allows them to generate volume even without us generating buyers and sellers. So that allows us to have kind of the inventory side of the equation. That's why that's growing so quickly. Now on the buyers and sellers, uh, at the end of the day, it's brand building, right? And um, one thing that, 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 that for sure doesn't work is doing it just through paid marketing, right? So for sure, we do some paid marketing, et cetera, but we're building a lot of, of tools, whether it's through SEO, where we're doing a lot of work on the SEO side of the business, where that, that, that inventory that we're building allows it to be easier and easier to build SEO over time. At the end of the day, you need volume to build SEO. And I think that's that's a big part of what we're doing there. And then we've also done some deals on the on, on the media side of the business, which allows us to have more exposure on media and allows us to build the brand while we're while we're building the other parts of the business, right? But it's a combination, right? It's building inventory, which when buyers and sellers come in, they're able to make a full decision on on, on our site, and then also building brand at the same time, so we're top of mind when a buyer and seller is looking to, to transact. I want to talk quickly about, so you mentioned it there, this uh, Bolsa Immobiliaria that you guys have built, which is essentially kind of a multiple listing service. I think it's something that maybe people running real estate portals in other countries might be potentially interested in, but maybe don't fully understand. It's something that I've seen um, covering the Latin American you know, real estate portal space. I know uh, FDV Latam or 360 Latam, how they like to be called these days. They've done it successfully. I know that the agent association in Mexico, uh, AMPI, they do it as well. What exactly, like, kind of is it and what are the benefits for portals? So you mentioned there you get more listings from it, but, like, do you monetize it? Um, how does it work and, you know, why build it? For us, it's, uh, it's, an, it's an ecosystem and it's an inventory builder, right? And what we do is we basically allow agents um, to list within this Bolsa Inmobiliaria. So this isn't viewed publicly. They list within the Bolsa Inmobiliaria where they can see all the inventory from all the agents that have uploaded their, their inventory, right? So if there's, a, if there's a third party agent that has a buyer, but they can't find the property for that buyer, they're able to look at um, our Bolsa Inmobiliaria and they can find other properties there and they can share a commission um, with that other agent, right? So again, remember that there's no full MLS in, in, in the market, right? So creating a tool where other agents can find other properties um, that have been curated, that have the right information, um, that they're able to share a commission um, with, with other agents, creates a lot of value for, for, for these agents. And for us, that's a free product that allows us to build the inventory, that allows us to create um, uh, an ecosystem. And then the next year is uploading that inventory onto the public site, right? So we connect that inventory onto cloud.com. Um, and what, so once they're in the board of order, it's very easier for us to connect it onto the, onto the public site. Um, but it's just a way of generating much more ecosystem within our platform. How, do you, how are you monetizing the, um, I understand the mortgage broking side, I understand the data side. How are you monetizing the, the advertising side of the business? 
Yeah. Um, so it, it, it evolves over time. Today, the, ma the main way we're monetizing is um, there's, 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 there's a couple of ways to, 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 for agents to work with us. One is um, a listing, a listing fee, where uh, when they pay us, they're getting all the direct leads to the inventory that is uploaded with us. Right, so a buyer comes in, they look at their property, that, that lead goes directly to that listing agent, uh, and they pay us to, to list those, those, those properties. Um, there's a second way we monetize, uh, which is uh, basically buyer brokers, right? There's some listings that we have that uh, are free listings and that we're not sending those listings directly to that listing agent because they're not, they're not paying. Uh, so we will send that to a buyer broker, right? And these are, uh, these are brokers that want to create more business. Um, and, and that allows us to have that combination of, hey, if you're paying on our site, you're going to get direct listings to inventory. If you're not paying on our site, you will get, you will get business, but you'll get it through a buyer broker. Um, and then the third way is similar, but on the seller side, right? We have sellers coming in and we sell that lead uh, to an agent that wants to, wants to work with that seller. Okay, so it's primarily through three models, paid list, Straight advertising model. One is a lead, a paper lead yep. type model, and the third, if you're giving paper it lead to again the, for a seller. yeah, so it's okay. So it's basically as a paper lead or a pay to list yep. type model. And so, are there any free listings on the site, or is it just purely hundred percent pay paid listings? There are free listings, um, which as you go through the Bolsa Immobiliare, which you can list for free and other agents can see it. You can also list for free on our site, but you will receive um, leads through a third party buyer broker that has paid for those um, to be there. Right. So anyone interested in that property, that goes to someone else who's a buy yeah. side lead and away yeah. you go. Yeah. And that means they're forced to share the commission. In Correct. the process, right? So at the end of the day, it's oh, pretty sorry, simple. Sorry, it's a little that, bit more that simple than that. At the end of the day, is if you pay, you're going to get all the direct leads straight to you. Uh, if you don't pay, you will get those leads through a third party agent that has paid um, to appear on our site as well. Well, you either pay, but at the end of the day, you either pay you or you're going to pay the buy side. Yeah, yeah, but depending agent. on kind of the size of the As brokerage, the et cetera, there's some agents that would rather uh, pay up front, make sure they get all direct leads. There are other smaller agencies or, or other smaller brokerages that say, hey, if, if I get a lead, I'm happy to pay and, and share a commission. Yep. What do you think are going to be the two or three key challenges in building out this part of the business? I mean, we go back to your original statement saying that you expect this, the cloud side of the business to be much larger, to be the major, you know, the lion's share of the revenue over time. What are going to be the two or three key challenges to build out that part of the yeah. business. Yeah, so I think you've, you've, you've covered it a little with the questions that you've been making along the way. No? And I think the biggest challenge that we have is how do we continue to build the brand? How do we build a big enough brand where people are thinking of cloud first when they're going to buy or sell a home, right? And, and really generating enough volume in terms of those buyers and sellers um, to, to, to then be able to work with, with, with agents that are paying us uh, for those leads, whether it's through advertising or, or, or whatever. But that's the biggest challenge at the end of the day, right? Inventory, um, I think we've, we've, we've proven pretty clearly that we're able to generate inventory on the site. That's going to continue to grow um, exponentially and really fast. Uh, but I think our biggest challenge going forward is how do we continue to build a big brand uh, in a market where there are some other bigger brands, uh, but we think that with what we're building, we're building a product that is differentiated in a way that makes sense for us to really be able to bring in more and more buyers and sellers onto the platform. That's the biggest one, no? I think it's no secret, right? When, when, when you're working versus these bigger players, it's how do you build a big enough brand to make sure you're generating enough traffic, um, both on the kind of branding side of the business, but also on the SEO side of the business, uh, making sure you're generating traffic there as well. Yeah, I think I think the from an outside in perspective and knowing the space pretty well, um, I think the chal I, I agree with the challenge on the brand building. I mean, brand building side. I think you, get, you can always secure listings at, at, for free if you need to build content. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's a well-trodden tro path. And, uh, you know, the Machulas and, and Trovets of the world have been doing that for, for uh, oh, geez, 15 years now. Um, and they've built a very strong um, understanding of SEO as well. The, the big challenge that I think you'll face is on that side is 
SEO, sourcing traffic from SEO has become much harder than it was even 12 months ago. Um, and it's not going to become easier um, over time. And it's just purely because Google and its algorithm changes are becoming far more focused on who is the true authority on this and a, a, a trusted source and so on, which is why you look at the matures and trovits of the world and they've been, you know, they've lost, you know, 50 plus percent of their traffic over the last six months just purely because of the Google's changing of the algorithms. And one of the things that leads to being an authority is time, which yep. is the one, one thing you can't buy, right? You just cannot make the clock go faster. Um, so I think that's going to be an interesting challenge in how to solve. And I think using social media and a range of other um, mechanisms will be, will be an interesting one. You need to take a leaf out of what uh, Domain's doing in Australia, where they're bundling for, the, for every property a social media presence. It just comes as part of the package now, rather than an add-on um, yeah. you know, from companies such as uh, Flow and, uh, and such. No, it's just they've actually bundled it into it. Why? Because they've, they've made that conscious decision that they are going to you know, go out there and drive more traffic and awareness, not only on the traditional SEO front or you know, through both um, uh, AdWords but, and, ad, um, and, and, and SEO, but they're also going to then get into all the other social media channels. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind of. I think the other big challenge that you will eventually face is the monetization. Um, and, and that's the, the first step of monetization is always easy because there's always the early adopters who will spend money. They'll hope that you're going to make it, you know, it's cheaper on Imuebles, uh, Vendicuatro or, or Vivanancius or whoever, right? You're going to, to make it cheaper for them. Uh, or they'll they'll they can you know pull their spend down. But the big challenge is getting to that the 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 not the early adopters, but it's that that core mass of um, you know agents who are you know been in the market a long time. They've seen players come and go. They've probably been using the same players for a long time. Is to getting them to change their mind or change their spend patterns, and then doing it in a world where you know there is a degree of um, uncertainty around volume of transactions because when you when you have um, non-exclusive agency it becomes harder to get revenue or get advertising revenue out of these guys so i think that's going to be a very interesting challenge on how you do that because i don't see uh, lamudi or in Weibless or vivinancius or propriedadis or whoever sort of lying down on the ground and having their tummy rubbed and saying i give up yeah, they're all they're all going to want to keep competing for that dollar, and the more who keep competing for that dollar, the harder it becomes. Yeah. So I th I think there is going to be a challenge um, around yeah, doing that, um, assuming that you can drive good traffic. Yeah. And leads. Yeah, there's, def there's definitely definitely agree. No, I think, and I think that goes along with 